The film also pays tribute to the Arab, the existence of which was the all-important factor in determining the site of Melbourne in 1835. As the story holds, you'll understand why the board chose the title, Mud of the City. This is the Yarra, Melbourne's ever-flowing river. Sometimes run clear through narrow gorges, sometimes meandering slowly between stately gums on the river flat. Sometimes spilling into billabongs that mark its ancient course. But always flowing, this has been its pattern of life for countless centuries. For centuries too, the Aborigines fashioned their frail bark canoes beside its clear water, cool crystal water that flowed from the mountains far away in the east. The natives called the river Beire Run. Its present name was bestowed upon it Nera, for Yara Yara really means water flowing over rocks. The Yara supplied many of their needs. Even the clay they used for plugging the ends of their canoes was taken from the river banks. But no longer do the natives make their canoes on the banks of the Yara. No longer do they spear eels in their favorite billabongs. The Yara tribes have passed on. Even the aboriginal name of the river is almost forgotten. A new era dawned when John Batman journeyed up the Yarra in 1835. And it was this selfsame river whose waters ran so pure and wholesome that prompted Batman to write in his diary, this will be the place for a village. Not knowing its name, he called the Yarra the Freshwater River. And in the short interval of a little over a century, a majestic city has arisen on the river banks that once vibrated to the stamp of bare black feet. Large vessels anchor where the native launched his frail canoe. His fishing haunts are hidden by factories that crowd the river's edge. And cattle graze in the valleys where he once pursued the nimble kangaroo. But let us return to Batman's village where a handful of huts were springing up on the northern bank of the Yarra. In those early days, the river was indeed the lifeblood of the settlement as its inhabitants depended entirely upon the Yarra for their water supply. They filled their buckets above a rocky bar situated a short distance upstream of the present Queen's Bridge. A little later, as the town extended its boundaries, pumps were erected on the riverbank upstream of Prince's Bridge and the water was hawked from door to door in barrels mounted on horse-drawn tumbrils. But within a decade, the Yarra had lost its former purity. The town's lifeblood thickened considerably as industries sprang up along its banks and poured their wastes into the river. And steamboats churned up the dark mud that lay like a viscous blanket on the riverbed. Little wonder that the townsfolk objected to paying up to 10 shillings a barrel for such water. With the opening of the Yan Yin system in 1857, it was no longer necessary to take water for drinking purposes from the Yarra within the precincts of the town. The new water supply was taken from the Plenty River, a tributary of the Yarra. Thus was established since followed in Melbourne of utilizing only the unpolluted headwaters of the Yarra and its tributaries. Being released from its major function of water supply, the Yarra, in its lower reaches, was free to assume the secondary role, which then have ascribed to it ever since. For Batman's freshwater river, and what a change there's been. Large ocean-going vessels now traverse the same course taken by Batman in a small rowing boat on a crisp in 1835. The wattles and scrub that once fringed the river have been removed to make way for endless wharves that receive the shipping of the world. And, near the heart of Melbourne, a new forest has replaced the tall gum trees, a forest of masts, rattle of chains, have replaced the warble of the magpie and the screech of the parakeets. Batman, in his most prophetic moments, could never have envisaged a scene such as. But as if to repent of our spoliation of the natural beauty of the lower reaches of the Yarra, we've straightened its course and replanted its banks with stately trees and beautiful lawns. We've made a streamlined stream for a streamlined age. 
This is the river that all Melbourne knows, the river we like to drive along and show our visitors. We've spanned the Yarrow with the fine bridges that are vital links in Melbourne's lines of communication. Over 30,000 vehicles cross this bridge each day, but how many of these motorists are aware of the beauty of the river they're crossing? The Yarra really comes into its own when there's a carnival. Its banks are riot of colour as aspiring beauty queens parade before the critical eyes of the judges. All Melbourne pays homage to its river on these occasions. Or when frail racing shells speed along the famous strait as brawny oarsmen compete for rowing honours. This is the Yarra in its happiest mood. But, like human beings, its mood changes with the weather, and heavy rain in the highlands can change the placid stream into an angry torrent overnight. River improvements protect the city from flooding, but further upstream the water spills over the river flats. In places, even the normal course of the river is obliterated. popularity declines sharply on these occasions, especially if one has to leave his front door by means of a canoe. With the river safe within its banks again, let us continue our tour of exploration. And what better means than from the deck of a riverboat? But how many see with unseeing eyes the ever-changing scene as the boat pushes slowly against the stream? How many would know, for instance, that Punt Road Bridge, now called Hoddle Bridge, got its name from the old punt that ferried the early residents of Peran across the river? Yes, every foot of the river up to Dites Falls is steeped in the romance of Melbourne's history. Every bend reveals a new vista, a new delight, known to very few of us today. The river is now tidal, as far as Dites Falls, where Thomas Dite erected a flour mill in 1841, the first mill in the colony. Here too, the first cattle driven overland from New South Wales crossed the Yarra. It is, however, only upstream from Dites Falls that the Yarra has retained most of its former natural beauty. Here, the sombre hues of the native river gums mingle with the vivid green of the willows. This is one of Melbourne's playgrounds, and many are its attractions a carefree jaunt along the river bank, or a boating party enjoyed by the whole family. Its angling devotees are legion. Each has his favorite spot, and whether the fish are biting or not, the Yarra offers a convenient escape from domestic chores at the weekend. Of course, the real enthusiasts for the Yarra are the hosts of swimmers who resort to the river banks on the hot summer days. It's doubtful, however, whether these swimmers, or indeed many of Melbourne citizens, are aware of the real significance of the Yarra in their daily lives. On the other hand, Sir George Gipps, an early governor, had no doubts about the matter when he remarked, it's the finest stream that I've seen in the colony. The governor, no doubt, was referring to the Yarra as the source of Melbourne's water supply. And Melbourne depends just as much on the river for water today as it did in Batman's day. So let us examine this basic role of the Yarra and see how it justifies its title, Life Blood of the City. First of all, let us look at the physical structure of the Yarra River catchment. This may be likened to a vast, irregular saucer. The southwestern portion of its rim is flattened and slopes gently towards Port Phillip Bay, while the northern, eastern and southeastern portions are elevated and crinkled to form part of the Great Dividing Range, with projecting spurs that separate the catchment of the Yarra's numerous tributaries. These tributaries rise on the perimeter of the Yarra Basin and flow into the main stream running in a southwesterly direction into Port Phillip Bay. 
three of Melbourne's water supply catchments are located at the head of the largest tributaries, the Plenty, the Maroondah and the O'Shaughnessy rivers. Fine perennial streams rising on the southern slopes of the Great Dividing Range. The flow of the Plenty River is supplemented by water from the Wallaby and Silver Creeks, which normally flow into the Goulburn River, but their headwaters have been diverted by means of an aqueduct that discharges into the Plenty River catchment. The Anyin Reservoir is the storage basin for the Plenty River scheme. Situated some 25 miles north of Melbourne and holding 7,200 million gallons, the reservoir was world-renowned when it was completed in 1857. The long, squat earthen embankment extending across a shallow valley at Yanin is dwarfed by the massive concrete dam on the Maroondah River near Healesville. 135 feet high and 946 feet long, the dam impounds over 6,000 million gallons of water behind its towering wall. The Maroondah Reservoir is fed from the Maroondah River and its tributaries. Both the Maroondah and Yanin systems cater for the low-level areas which were the first parts of Melbourne to be developed. The high-level areas are supplied from the O'Shaughnessy system. A small impounding reservoir regulates the flow of the O'Shaughnessy River, an exceptionally pure stream that rises high up in the Great Dividing Range. The O'Shaughnessy water is stored at Sylvan Reservoir in the Dandenong Ranges Holding nearly 9,000 million gallons, the reservoir can supply the highest areas in the metropolis. Open channels, tunnels and pipelines convey the water by gravity to the outskirts of the metropolis. But by old world standards, Melbourne is still a young city, and a young city either dies in its youth or it grows. Melbourne is still growing upwards in the city and outwards on the fringe. And as it grows, more and more water is required to keep pace with the ever-increasing demand. With all the available catchments on the Arras tributaries fully developed, where could Melbourne turn for additional supplies? The logical place, of course, was the headwaters of the Yarra River itself. As far back as 1888, it was realized that one day, the Upper Yarra catchment would be required for Melbourne's water supply and its catchment was reserved for this purpose. Fifty years later, a vision became a necessity and the Board of Works planned to build in the Upper Yarra Valley its largest dam, a dam that would ensure that Melbourne would have ample water for many years to come. The surveyors, the pioneers of all construction works, had hardly begun to clear the scrub and set out trial centre lines and survey stations when World War II intervened. The proposed dam suffered its first major setback. 1945, peace, and Melbourne embarked on an era of development unprecedented in its history. Rural areas changed to suburban as thousands of new homes and factories spread over grassy fields at the fringe of the metropolis. People from Britain, from war-torn Europe, and from the Mediterranean countries arrived in ever-increasing numbers. 60% of all migrants arriving in Victoria came to Melbourne and stayed. But whether it be a home or a factory, a hospital or a public park, water is still a basic need. The increased demand for water during the critical post-war years was reflected in greatly depleted storage reservoirs at the end of each summer. Melbourne had to have more water and have it quickly. The Upper Yarra scheme became top priority, but a large dam is not built overnight. And to utilize the day-to-day -day flow of the Upper Yarra, a 68-inch diameter steel pipeline to bring the water to the city was constructed first. Commencing at the downstream end of the Upper Yarra Aqueduct, built some years ago, the pipeline traverses the Yarra Basin for 23 miles and terminates at Sylvan Reservoir. 
work on the pipeline started immediately after the war when the small village of Sylvan was awakened by huge machines that gouged a deep trench in the rich red clay of the countryside. Noisy tractors added to the din as they maneuvered large mobile cranes used for transporting the pipes along the route and lowering them into the trench. See how carefully these machines handle the pipes so as to avoid damaging their protective coating. The pipes were coated at the board's depot at Preston, where all pipes used in Melbourne's water supply system are protected against corrosion. This plant ensures a long life to the pipelines, since uncoated steel pipes are extremely vulnerable to electrolytic and uh, soil corrosion. So as to render the pipes resistant to these corrosive agents, they're coated both inside and out with coal tar enamel. The pipes are then spirally wrapped with asbestos felt strip so as to prevent mechanical damage to the coating during transportation and pipe laying. Care in handling the coated pipes was therefore a matter of vital importance. This fact was impressed on every workman long before the red clay of the hills around Sylvan was left behind and the pipeline snaked towards the distant mountains. The choice of trench digging equipment depended largely on the nature of the ground to be excavated. Here, a trenching machine was in its element as it dug into soft yellow rock. But whether in red clay or yellow rock, soft brown earth or stiff black clay, the going was always hard during and after rain. Laying large pipes with equipment working in mud up to the axles is not a congenial task. But with the water supply of a city at stake, the board could not afford to make the pipeline a fine weather job. Pipe laying on steep slopes was by far the most spectacular part of the whole project. Mitchell's Hill, within a stone's throw of one of the construction camps at uh, Hoddle's Creek, was a typical example. This hill was so steep that a cradle running on rails laid on either side of the trench was necessary, the pipes being lowered into position by means of a winch worked by hand. The hand winch method was superseded later by using two tractors working in tandem, the forward one being attached to the mobile crane, whilst the rear tractor remained at the top of the hill to act as a brake on the other. The welders, working close behind the pipe layers, then welded the pipes into one continuous length. Each welded joint was tested by drilling a small hole through the outer plate and applying compressed air so as to detect any leaks. Finally, the joint was coated both inside and out with coal tar enamel using special forms into which the hot enamel was poured. The pipeline has a capacity of 75 million gallons a day. At a later date, it will be duplicated so as to carry 150 million gallons a day. This is the capacity of the tunnel through Mount Little Joe at Warburton. Forming an integral part of the conduit, the 6,000-foot tunnel was blasted through granite and hard rock. When the Upper Yarra conduit was completed in 1953, water from the Upper Yarra could flow directly into Sylvan Reservoir. The completion of this undertaking also released men and equipment for the second and final stage of the Upper Yarra scheme, the construction of the Upper Yarra Dam. The Upper Yarra Dam was well underway when the pipeline was opened, and the Yarra Valley thundered to the noise of shovels and tractors, of jackhammers and heavy trucks, a concentration of activity and power, of dust and din, out of which was emerging a mountain of rock and earth. The visions of the water supply engineers for decades past were at last being fulfilled.
Wilhelm Davidson may have visualized this day 70 years ago when he induced the government to reserve the Upper Yarra catchment for water supply purposes. But Davidson would have marveled at the structure planned by the engineers of today. A mountain of earth and rock spanning the Yarra Valley 16 miles beyond Warburton. A man-made mountain 293 feet high or 80 feet higher than the Manchester Unity Building in Melbourne. A mountain whose base would span two city blocks, or say from Russell Street to Elizabeth Street. Such was the structure contemplated by the Board of Works when immediately after the war the site was cleared of trees. and excavators began to remove the overburden from the seat of the dam. The problem of accommodation arose with the first influx of the workmen, and the Yarra Valley just below the dam site began to look like a boom town as rows of houses sprang up amongst the peppermint and messmate trees. Only once before, when the Upper Yarra region was invaded by gold seekers in the 1860s, has the valley witnessed such a scene of human activity. But it's a far cry from the flimsy tents of the Fossickers to the comfortable timber houses erected for the married workers and their families, or even the two men huts built for the single men. Moreover, in this 20th century boom town, the emphasis was on sanitation. Its only industry was to be water supply, Melbourne's water supply, and precautions had to be taken accordingly. And so a complete sewerage system was installed to serve the whole town. This was necessary to safeguard the area against possible pollution. But the provision of a sewerage system was only one of the many preliminary tasks on this vast construction job. A good water supply had to be provided for domestic and firefighting purposes. Electricity had to be brought from Warburton to serve the houses and to provide power for the electrically operated plant. An all-weather road linking the works with Warburton was a matter of the utmost importance. This involved realigning and regrading 16 miles of the old Woods Point Road. And what a superb highway was constructed. What a difference from the tortuous old route winding along the riverbank. Cobb's coaches rumbled along this road in the 1890s and hundreds of miners have tramped its dusty length on their way to the diggings. Their quest was gold, shining alluvial gold glittering in the sand on the river bed. But now, the goal was water, water for the ever-growing city straddling the mouth of this self-same river 50 miles downstream. Water was the goal of these miners who gouged at the foot of the mountain adjoining the dam site as they commenced to build the diversion tunnel to carry the flow of the river during the construction of the dam. The 25 feet diameter tunnel was driven through 2,600 feet of solid rock and was the first major task associated with the Upper Yarra Works. After the tunnel had been lined with concrete, its diameter was reduced to 20 feet, which still provided ample waterway for a medium flood. The Yarra was diverted through a tunnel on a chill winter's day in June 1953, and a watery sun filtered through the blue smoke from the fires of the clearing gangs as dozers pushed load after load of earth and rock into the river. And as if to test the strength of the tunnel and the skill of man, the river rose in a minor flood. Hour after hour, the struggle went on. But the machines won, the breach in the diversion dam was closed, and a lake quickly formed in front of the tunnel inlet. The Yarra, rushing from the tunnel portal, heralded the day long awaited by the dam builders. For them, it was the signal for full steam ahead on the greatest project undertaken by the board, the building of a new mountain in the Yarra Valley. It was, however, to be different from an ordinary mountain. 
The mountain designed by the engineers was to have the earth on the inside and the rock on the outside. One could best describe it as a, a normal mountain in reverse. Like all mountains, however, it had to rest on a very solid foundation. This entailed the removal of all the earth and soft rock overlying the bedrock. But even the bedrock was not entirely solid. The excavations revealed cracks and fissures which had to be sealed if the foundation was to be watertight. And so rows of holes were drilled deep into the bedrock of the dam seat. Liquid cement was then pumped into the holes at very high pressure. This effectively sealed all the cracks and rock faults through which water could percolate when the dam was completed. A reinforced concrete cutoff wall was also necessary to prevent water seeping along the base of the dam. Running the full length of the dam, this wall was keyed into the bedrock and projected 10 feet into the lower layers of the earth fill. The main components of the dam were earth and rock. Fortunately, suitable types of both materials were found in sufficient quantity to hand, and the problem resolved itself into deciding the most economical method of excavating and conveying seven and a half million cubic yards of them to the embankment. The answer lay in big equipment. Big equipment such as this electrically driven shovel whose giant bucket excavated three and a half yards of earth at each bite. Working around the clock, this huge machine kept a fleet of trucks on the move, transporting earth to the dam nearly a mile distant. But the machine which was able to move mountains was this massive mechanical loader powered by two tractors working in tandem. Digging and loading in one continuous operation, this machine filled a 30-yard truck in 60 seconds. This was earth moving on a grand scale. It literally ate the mountain and disgorged it into huge trucks traveling alongside. It was in its element working in the red clay required for the very heart of the dam, the central wedge of impervious fill. was a different proposition. It had to be procured the hard way by drilling and blasting. Working on flat rock terraces in the quarry, huge drilling machines bored a series of holes up to 40 feet deep which were charged with explosive. After wiring, the charge was fired electrically. Seventeen tons of high explosives was the power behind that blast and some 77,000 tons of shattered rock crashed down onto the bench. The smoke and dust had barely cleared away before the shovels and trucks moved in to reap the harvest of rock. Over four million yards of hard blue-gray stone was required for the rock fill zones of the dam and many more thousands of yards were required for crushing into aggregate for the numerous concrete structures associated with the dam. All roads led to the dam. Roads that were forever changing their routes as the dam rose higher in the valley. Roads that vibrated to the roar of heavy trucks. Noisy, bustling roads that made a busy city street sound by comparison as quiet as a country lane. Focal point, the destination of the trucks that thundered heavily laden out of the quarries. The dam was the main center of activity where the roar of tractors competed with the thunder of trucks. 
a ceaseless noise that numbed the ears and reverberated far along the valley, an ever-present reminder of the modern machine age. The central earth zone was the critical part. There could be no guesswork here, for the stability and water tightness of the embankment depended not only on using materials having the necessary physical properties, but also in placing them correctly. And this involved more than just tipping the earth on the embankment. It had to be spread in thin layers that could be thoroughly compacted with grooved and sheep's foot rollers. Each type of roller had to pass over a given area a certain number of times before the next layer was added. This sequence of operations, placing, spreading and rolling, continued from the foundations to the very crest of the dam. In order to ensure that the physical properties of the earth measured up to the required standards, samples were taken from the embankment at frequent intervals during its construction. They were then tested in the soil's laboratory located at the works. This sample is being prepared for what is known as the drop test, by means of which the moisture content of the soil is quickly and easily determined. But engineers have found that earth is a very unpredictable structural material and the soils test gives no indication of the complex interplay of forces inside the dam. To provide this information, pressure tips to measure the internal water pressures on the earth were installed at various levels in the embankment. Each tip was connected by means of thin copper tubes to a gauge which indicated the build-up of any internal pressures which could be detrimental to the dam which, during the early stages of construction, was rather shapeless, a broad expanse of earth flanked on either side by grey stone. It was not until the work was well advanced that the characteristic profile of the dam became apparent and the equipment began to crowd the ever-narrowing crack. But a dam is not built by machines alone. The machines had to be operated by men. A great number of men were required also for the numerous works associated with the dam. At times, over 1,000 men were employed on this immense undertaking and harmonious human relationships were as vital as the engineering aspects of the work. Good accommodation, compatible with the anticipated duration of the work, was possibly the most important factor in establishing congenial working conditions. Most of the single workers were housed in the camp adjacent to the town. Catering arrangements for the single workers were outstanding. Few hotels could boast of more modern kitchen facilities or could provide better meals than those served in the vast dining halls. The married men and their families lived in these comfortable timber houses provided with water, electricity and sewerage facilities. They were thus able to enjoy most of the amenities of town life in a country setting. A preschool centre was one of the many activities run by the women folk in the town. A state school was provided for the older children Many of these healthy young Australians completed their primary education at the Upper Yarra Dam State School. And no doubt, they'll long remember their childhood days that were spent in a large construction town in the Yarra Valley.
The cooperative store was a community effort. With its well-stocked shelves and wide assortment of goods, it was a veritable shopping center for all who were stationed at the works. As in all Australian communities, field sports were the main form of recreation after working hours and at the weekends. Cricket, tennis and football, each sport had its ardent adherents who indulged in their favorite sporting activities on the playing field almost in the shadow of the huge embankment. But work on the dam never stopped completely, even at the weekends. When climatic conditions were suitable, the placing and consolidation of embankment materials went on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Shop too was rarely silent. With equipment and plant working to capacity, regular maintenance and overhauls were essential if costly breakdowns were to be avoided. And like the time and the tide, setting concrete waits for no man. Concrete was practically the universal material used in the various auxiliary structures associated with the dam. Naturally, it was required in enormous quantities. This involved the provision of a large concrete mixing plant which was completely automatic in operation. By means of press buttons and indicator lights, one man was able to control the batching, weighing and mixing of the materials and then discharge the concrete into buckets for conveying it to the job. The greatest consumer of concrete was the spillway structure, some 50,000 yards going into this structure alone. The function of the spillway is to return surplus water into the river downstream from the dam when the reservoir is full. The massive ski jump at the lower end of the spillway chute accounted for much of the concrete used. The design of the spillway and other auxiliary structures was influenced greatly by the results of hydraulic tests on scale models at the various structures. The value of such models will be apparent from the fact that 50,000 pounds were saved by modifying the initial spillway design in the light of experience gained by subjecting a scale model of the structure to similar conditions anticipated in actual practice. Here, the model is operating as the actual spillway would under major flood conditions. A flood of this magnitude would occur only on rare occasions, possibly once in a thousand years. Nevertheless, the spillway must be designed to carry such a flood, the occurrence of which would reveal quickly any faults in design or any structural weaknesses. To withstand the severe conditions imposed on the spillway structure during floods, reinforced concrete of high quality and durability was imperative, and the whole concreting program was geared to achieve this objective. The long, steeply sloping floor of the spillway received special attention. Not only did this necessitate very heavy steel reinforcement, but meticulous care had to be taken to ensure that the floor surface was perfectly smooth and even, since irregularities in the surface could endanger the structure when the spillway was in operation. Outlet structure takes a vital valley immediately upstream of the dam. The water in the reservoir is drawn off by four hydraulically operated valves connected to a sloping conduit constructed down one side of the valley and feeding two large pipes carried through a tunnel under the southern abutment of the dam. These pipes discharge into a stilling pool which is also the starting point of the water on its long journey to the city. Before the storage of water could commence, however, 
the area to be submerged by the water in the reservoir had to be completely cleared of timber and under. The small settlement at McVee's, two miles up the river from the dam, lay in the path of the clearing gangs and had to be demolished. Paddy McGee's historic little inn vanished as completely as Cobb's coaches, which pulled up at his door at the turn of the century. Both vanished a march of progress. Today, the Upper Yarra Dam is completed and the water of the reservoir extends far up the valley. Its completion marks the climax to 100 years of achievement in Melbourne's water supply. It also marks the final stage in the development of the Yarra River for water supply purposes. How apt then of the Governor of Victoria, General Sir Dallas Brooks, when he opened the reservoir on the 26th of November, 1957. Now behind all of you and me, there is much you can see, there is much you cannot see. For the truth is that it is the result of unremitting labor of grand Victorian citizens. And they have excavated millions of tons of soil and of stone to make this possible. And I do ask this afternoon that when in Melbourne we nonchalantly turn on our water taps and we wash this lovely clean water gushing out, we realize the enormity of the work that which has been done to make this possible. For our water is the cleanest water anywhere. And many people have said to me that Melbourne water is champagne of water. The champagne of water. Herein lies the secret of Melbourne's world-famed water supply. Sparkling, pure, untreated water from the headwaters of the Yarra and its tributaries. Yes, Melbourne's priceless asset. For an abundant supply of pure water is, and always will be, one of the keys to prosperity. And for many years to come, the Yarra River will supply that water. Need anyone then doubt the veracity of its title, lifeblood of the city?